This is uh, Sharon Rosenzweig Lipson from uh, our main sponsor, Life, and we're so happy that you're here and uh, can tell us about uh, the amazing stuff you're doing. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here today to speak. Um, as mentioned, I'm Sharon Rosenzweig Lipson. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Life Biosciences. Today, I'm going to talk to you about epigenetic reprogramming, a novel gene therapy that restores visual function in a non-human primate model of uh, NION, which is non-autoritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. As we've been talking about for the last few days, diseases of aging affect large percentages of the population, and among those 60 or older, 80% have at least one chronic illness and 50% have at least two chronic illnesses. This is creating a rapidly increasing burden on the social and economic stability and is impacting quality of life in a number of ways, including by affecting vision loss, dementia, hearing loss, difficulty breathing, muscle weakness, and many, many more um, impacts. If you, as you can see in the, do I have a pointer? Okay. Um, as you can see over here, uh, vision loss is uh, clearly an age-related phenomenon, and you can see quite a bit of it as we age, and you can start to see as you age as well, a little bit later, an increase in blindness. On the right, you can see increases in dementia prevalence over time. And currently, most of the treatments that are being used are addressing some of the symptomatology while the underlying disease continues to progress. So therapeutics that could reverse underlying age-related disease processes remains a key unmet need. Today I'm going to talk to you about epigenetic reprogramming. Uh, epigenetics refers to the study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect how your genes work. So we can think about drinking, smoking, um, exercise or lack thereof, all of which ha can cause epigenetic, epigenetic changes. Unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible and don't actually change your DNA sequence, but rather how your body reads a DNA sequence. One form of epigenetic change is DNA methylation, and you can see increase or hypermethylation in both aging and injury. Um, as you can see, you know, we've all been talking about these, you know, chronological age and methylated DNA age correlation plots um, all the last few days. Epigenetic reprogramming refers to the erasure and remodeling of epigenetic marks, such as removal of this DNA hypermethylation. So life sciences approach is to focus on partial epigenetic reprogramming. So as we all know, Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize for a work he did on complete reprogramming, where he identified four specific factors, transcription factors, OCK4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK, all of which when combined together can take mature cells and take them all the way back to pluripotent stem cells. Um, while successful, in vitro to do all of that, it also has been shown that in vivo, you may cause some teratomas. So what Life Biosciences has been focusing on is partial epigenetic reprogramming, where we're using expression of three Yamanaka factors, OS and K, OC4, SOX2, KLF4. Um, we've removed CMYK, which has oncogenic properties, and we've been able to demonstrate that you can reverse the epigenetic clock with no loss of cell identity and no tumor formation. So these are really important improvements over OSKM by just using OSK. Um, so a number of papers have already been published showing that epigenetics can drive mammalian aging and that these effects are reversible um, and that these epigenetic marks, including DNA methylation, are primary drivers of mammalian aging as, uh, as a reversible, and that OSK can be used to rejuvenate cells, to reverse aging, and to repair injury. So where do you go first? So as Kelsey just mentioned before, eye is a great place to go, and our first indications are focused on optic neuropathies, both chronic and acute, which have retinal ganglion cell dysfunction. So we're, we're approaching primary open angle glaucoma, and as mentioned before, NION. Um, Glaucoma is a chronic progressive disease um, with 3 million folks having it in the US. It's a group of conditions that affect the optic nerve, characterized often by increased ocular pressure, and it's the only known modifiable risk factor at this time. 
It is the leading cause of blindness for people over age 60. And risk factors include aging, family history, race, use of systemic or topical corticosteroids, and high intraocular pressure. There are currently no lasting treatments for glaucoma, so even if you lower IOP, the disease continues to progress. And so disease management just involves IOP lowering medication, laser surgery, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, or ultimately a more uh, trabeculectomy. NION is another RGC dysfunction disorder, but in this case, it's a sudden painless loss of vision in one eye. So literally people go to sleep at night, they wake up the next morning, and they have a loss of vision in one eye. Um, it's about two to, th two to 10 people per 100,000. Uh, the mechanism is a loss of blood flow to the optic nerve, which leads to the sudden vision loss. It's the most common acute optic neuropathy in patients over the age of 50. And again, risk factors include aging, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and importantly, previous evidence of NION in one eye. So if you have it in one eye, there's a reasonable chance that over the next five to 10 years, you might have a NION incident in the second eye. And there are no current treatments currently available. So we're gonna apply partial epigenetic reprogramming to retinal ganglion cells. So the goal here is to take a mature cell and convert it to a healthy younger cell, again, while maintaining cell identity. So we're gonna express OSK in cells, increase TED activity, look at, see changes in DNA methylation pattern back to a more youthful state, leading to retinal ganglion cell rejuvenation and then ultimately axon regrowth and vision restoration. To do this, we're using ER100, which is a controlled expression of OSK. It's a TET-on system where we're using two vectors, two AAV2 vectors. The first is under a CMV promoter to create an RTTA. And the second is under a TRE promoter, which is controlled so OSK does not express. Um, and then when you, the RTTA is formed and combines with systemic administration of doxycycline, what you can do is get it to bind to the promoter here and cause the expression of OSK. And so if you look over here, you can see in the retina, you can look when they, there's no doxycycline, you can see RGC cells, but you don't see uh, expression of KLF4. And then when you administer doxycycline, you can see this co-expression of KLF4, indicating that with doxycycline, you can get OSK to its target and turn it on. So ER100 has been used to improve vision, visual function, and DNA methylation in a number of mouse models of aging, noptic nerve crush, and glaucoma. So starting at the left, we can look at the effects in aging. Um, and so the first thing we're looking at here is an optomotor response. So this is a response where the uh, mouse basically is turning its head and moving it back and forth in response to a series of lines that are moving. You can see in aging, can we do it for this side of the room? Uh, you can see that there's a decrease in this optomotor response and then a reversal with OSK. Not only do we see this in aging, but it, uh, OSK reversed the vision loss, but we can also see reverses in DNA hypermethylation. In the center panel, you can see the effects in an optic nerve crush model. And there you can see that before the crush, you can see evidence of the and it functioning the nerve functioning, and then you can see this loss of function after the uh, nerve crush that is restored af after administration of OSK. I want to also point out that you can see just an aging phenomenon here because you can see that you can even see an improvement as you give OSK even before the crush. And finally, in the panel on the right, I want to focus on a microbead model of glaucoma and here I'm going to show you some of the data from a pattern electroretinogram. So this is a series of signals that are going back and forth and switching. Um, and what you can see here is if you give, before you give the microbeads, or if there are no microbeads, you see the electroretinogram uh, signal amplitude. And then, again, baseline, once there are microbeads, you see a marked attenuation of this amplitude. And then in the presence of OSK, so focus on the bar all the way to the right, you can see that you have this improvement in the amplitude. You can see it here also, where you can see this is with the beads and the gray, and then the presence of OSK, you see the restoration of this signal. Not only can you see 
improvement in the pattern ERG, but you can also see improvements in vision as measured by an optomotor response. Taken together, what you can see is in a number of different ways that we can look at RGC function or dysfunction in a mouse, we can see consistent and reproducible findings across all of these models for the effect of OSK. How about safety? I mentioned before that there aren't, you know, we were doing this in OSK and not OSKM in order to avoid tumorigenic effects and effects on health. So we've administered AAV9 OSK intravitrally, and you can see that after 17 months of continuous OSK induction, there are no negative effects on overall health or on body weight. There are no evidence of tumor or effects on white blood cell counts when starting at 10 months of age and continuing in aged mice. When we look after intravitreal administration, again, you can see normal architecture and absence of tumors in the retina after 15 months of OSK expression, and no discernible changes in retinal structure or retinal thickness or even obvious tumors in a mouse glaucoma model after 21 months. Mice are good, but even better would be if we could make this translation to non-human primates. So mice have low visual acuity, they have non-foveal vision, they have a distinct pattern of retinal aging, and they lack some of the same higher order visual processing, whereas non-human primates and humans have many of similar functions, and they also have an inner limiting membrane, which serves as a little bit of a barrier to transduction. So first thing that was done was we used a AAV2 and a GFP, gave an intravitreal ejection just to look to see where could we get AAV2 to deliver to, and you can see that you get parafoveal expression and superior and inferior expression, suggesting that it was worthwhile to go ahead and test OSK. So let me just tell you briefly about this non-arteric uh, anterior ischemic model, or nion model. So basically a laser is used to the optic nerve head that creates this damage. Uh, and basically what we're looking here is at a pattern electrogram. Again, this is the signal that's shifting back and forth, this checkerboard design. If we look at a human, the human nion condition, what you can see is in the control eye, you can see this very nice pattern. You get a peak, you get a valley, um, and a very nice curve. In nion, what you can see is you attenuate the peak, you attenuate the valley, and you can see that the slope gets changed. If we look in the laser-induced nion model in the non-human primates, now we can see, again, this characteristic signal. The top of the peak is a P50, the bottom is a 95, so we can look at the upward deflection to P50, we can look at the entire amplitude from P50 to N95, and then we can look at what happens after the laser damage, where you can see this attenuation of P50, attenuation of this N95 signal, and a change in the slope, suggesting that this is a highly translatable model from non-human primate to the nion condition. So we did a rescue study looking at administration of ER100 one day post laser. So we wanted to make sure that the damage has already started to occur. Remember people with nion, they wake up the next morning, the damage is done. So we didn't want to start by treating ahead of time. We want to be able to treat after the damage begins. And then uh, we administer doxycycline for a period out to six weeks. Uh, we had an N of four in the vehicle treated group, an N of six in the OSK treated group. And in each animal, you have a control eye that has no treatment, and then the eye that either got laser in vehicle or laser and OSK. If we look at the top fi figure on the right, you can see the P50 amplitude. And what you can see is starting at week one and going out to five weeks, you can see that the damage, there's a decrease in P50 from the laser treatment. Um, and you can see a decrease in this uh, P P50 minus N95, indicating that the laser-induced damage was consistent with producing the model that we expected. ER100 reverses these pattern ERG deficits in the model. So again, if we look at P50 here, you can see there was no difference at baseline for the groups. And now what you can see, although not significant, you can even start to see at week three um, a, a big change in pattern ERG that becomes significant at weeks three and week five for the P50 amplitude. And for P50 minus N95, again, you can see a strong trend at week three, and then it becomes statistically significant at week five. 
So now what we've done is we've been able to demonstrate that we can go from mouse to human, we can take multiple methods of RGC dysfunction and demonstrate that we can reverse them. I wanna show you two individual animals just to highlight a little bit more about what the effects that we're seeing. So if we look at the vehicle animal over here, you can see baseline in blue, actually baseline in blue is on both, you can see it pretty consistently and reproducibly. And then look at vehicle at one week and five weeks post laser and you can see there's this massive blunting of the pattern ERG signal. If we look in the tre treated monkey, what you can see here, if you look at the green line, you can see an attenuation here of the P50, but really you can see is this whole curve is markedly affected. But the important thing is to look at week five. So five weeks post-treatment, and now what you can see is this P50 response is returning, but more importantly, the entire shape and nature of the curve has been restored, indicating an effect of OSK. So our ER program uh, is rapidly advancing and leading to the first human clinical trials. We've shown efficacy across a number of animal models. We're in the process of manufacturing now to plan for NIND enabling studies and ultimately phase one clinical trials in optic neuropathies. Um, we've demonstrated efficacy in a number in optic neuropathies involving retinal ganglion cell dysfunction. That intravitreal injection of OSK or ER100 improves visual function and axon health in a non-human primate model of nine, building on the efficacy that we saw in the mouse models of visual aging and glaucoma. Um, as well as there's no adverse safety findings in mice following 15 months of systemic delivery or 21 months of intravitreal delivery. Um, quite a few people have gone in, into uh, completing this work. So there's the team at Life Biosciences, um, including folks that may not be with us at Life anymore, but Joan Manick and Jennifer Cermak, who were involved in the earlier days of this program. Um, obviously our collaborators at Harvard Medical School and our founder, David Sinclair, um, and a lot of work that we've done with Joe Rizzo, who's an expert in NION, Bruce Cassander, and his group, um, and then the team at Versio that was involved in running the NION study for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Really amazing. That, that was a great talk. Thank you. But I have a question. So patients wake up and there's been a blood clot, something to stop blood. So there are dead cells. So how do you... So they are degenerating cells. In other words, we, we now know that if you start to look over time, that these cells are dying, but not necessarily dead. So there's still opportunity to rescue out for a period of time. And so that's what we're attempting to do now. We're, so I think for the clinical trials, we're gonna aim to start do it within 14 days, but there's evidence that out to a month or more, there's still degeneration occurring. The last part of the question was, do you reckon you could go back and see a patient who experienced this 10 years ago and maybe do something? I don't think so. At least not yet. I think there has to be something to rescue still. Oh, yeah. Um, the TET system requires this constitutive expression of the TET transactivator. Aren't you concerned that this raises an immune response in your recipients? So we're looking for all of that. So as we are doing both the uh, NHP NION studies as well as our GLP TOX studies, we'll be looking for these kinds of immune responses and, and be evaluating them. All right. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was really fantastic. Thank you.